over the distant hilltops and reasonably far away, hidden from the cities and a long way from the shore, there is a truly green and pleasant land. It's a wild kingdom of many faces, savage fell tops, exquisite waterfalls, and ancient woods, full of secret places for both rare and beautiful wildlife to hide. It's a land that time forgot somehow. Throughout it all flows one of the purest and most beautiful rivers in the country. Best of all, it has an ancient recipe, not just for a happy natural life, but also, perhaps more surprisingly, for a cracking bit of cheese. This is a portrait of Wensleydale, the broadest and perhaps even the grandest of all Yorkshire's great green dales. A wide, step-sided valley which flows east from the top of the northern Pennines and out onto the great flat Vale of York. It's the beautiful home of some great human characters too passionate protectors of its rare wildlife. And the guardians who keep its ancient traditions alive. Cheese has been made in Wensleydale for a thousand years. Started in the 1120s with the French Cistercian monks. And now it's made by local Wensleydale people and the recipe has been handed down for many generations. Alice Amsden, works at the Wensleydale Creamery, a job she's treasured for 14 years. It is a living food, is cheese. Um, very natural, but you've actually got to test each one to ensure that it has developed in the time scale that we expected it to develop. You visually inspect it, you smell it, and finally, if you want to, which I always do, you uh, actually taste it. In Yorkshire, a dale is a valley. Originally carved out by Ice Age glaciers long ago, the dales today are ruled by rivers. Most are named after them too, but not Wensleydale. Its heart, its river, is the Ure. Brian Morland has spent most of his life at its side. I've always enjoyed the River Ewer. I had an idyllic childhood. I had a perfect childhood. It was almost swallows and Amazons. Um, during the 1950s, late 1950s, my grandmother used to live on a farm at West Witten, in the heart of Wensleydale, right alongside the River Ewer. And she used to take me out across the fields as a child. She'd take me down to the river, taught me how to catch crayfish, showed me the trout, and that fired an interest which has been with me all my life. I love to sit and, if you like, go up about. I enjoy just sitting and looking at things. I mean, if you sit quietly on a riverbank, there's so much to see. After a while, the wildlife just takes you for granted. You can sit down, you can see garden warblers, willow warblers, and you can sit and enjoy them at close quarters. You don't need binoculars. If you sit quiet, the wildlife comes to you.
this water flows straight off the Pennines, the magnificent backbone of England, a giant watershed. The starting point for the River Ure and the source of life for the whole valley. I don't like milking cows, I like cows. And, you know, they've always been part of my life. Cheese making starts with milk, and Tom Chapman's cows are only too happy to oblige. Well, most of the time. Every cow is a different character. And there's one, she only has two gears, I say one's neutral. <laughs> but you know, they all have a different character. You know which cow you're milking and she knows, she knows you. Some don't like you and some do. If you have harsh words with them, they don't forget you, but uh, you no, know, as long as you're kind to them, they, you know, they're quite happy to be, to, to be handled by you. We start about half past seven in the morning, sometimes earlier. We finish at eight o'clock and sometimes later. But uh, we usually work 12 hours a day. With dairy and it's seven days a week, 365 days a year. And there's an awful lot of young lads around here who don't want that sort of commitment. They'd rather have an easier life and go to football on Saturday and pub on Sunday. <laughs> The limestone pastures don't just grow great grass for dairy cows and cheese making. The wet Pennine weather means the entire valley is a treasure trove of wildflowers. High up at its head, there are alpine meadows where drifts of globe flowers stand proud over bright pink bird's eye primroses. Lower down, the verdant woods are washed with the colors of spring. There are oceans of bluebells. Bridal carpets of pristine wood and enemies. And the grand summer finale, the golden glory of the traditional hay meadow. Not all of Wensleydale's natural treasure is quite so easy to find. There are secret oases here with unexpected guardians, if you know where to look. This is Foxglove Covert, a personal dream brought to life by one dedicated army major, Tony Crease. I think what, what got me into uh, wildlife in the first place was a crusty old schoolmaster who sparked my imagination, I think, more years ago than I care to remember. And I've always been interested in wildlife since then. What makes Foxglove so surprising is that the sanctuary Tony created is right in the middle of one of Europe's largest military bases, Catrick Garrison. You would never know that you are about 75 yards from the tank hangars. You could almost be 50 miles from Catrick Garrison, and you could be right at the head of the dale. What is special about Foxglove Cover is the variety of habitats that we have here. We have ancient semi natural woodland, we have willow car, we have heathland, we have lots of water bodies, we have conifer woodland, we have uh, shrub and grassland, so really we have a, a bit of everything. It just evolved. There was no grand plan in the beginning, and as people have come here and people have enjoyed it more, it's just happened. Much as the way that human life in Wensleydale evolved too. A way of farming developed which not only encouraged cheese making, it created the Dale's unique living landscape. The 
it's a lattice of dry stone walls and old field barns. Ancient traditions, which Tom keeps alive. Oh, I like a bit of walling. Something I've always liked. Well, I've got to like doing more in recent years than what I did there, but I do like a bit of walling. It's something different, I think that's what it is. You know, from the daily routine. The stone walls were built to claim land and mark out fields about 300 years ago. But it was the field barns out in the lush hay meadows which were the key to Wensleydale's success. We keep the hay in here, and then when we go to feed the cows, we take a bale through into the shipping end. And feed them there. I'm one of the last people to uh, use one of these barns for its original purpose. Most of them, there's mostly quite a lot still standing, but they're not used for keeping cattle in anymore. The old Dale's way of dairy farming was driven by the seasonal extremes of the weather. During summer, the cattle could live outside. Summer was also the time for haymaking, storing food to feed the cows ready for the harsh winter and seven cold, dark months inside. There's quite a bit of wildlife about. We have jackdaws. As you can see, there's a big nest up on the top there. We get all sorts on the floor, rats and <laughs> rabbits come in for summer and when there's no hay in. They'll come in in winter if they can get in and live on hay. Both people and animals need to be tough and resourceful to survive here in a world where the weather drives everything. Climate not only shapes their lives, it gives the river its many faces too. The River Ewer in the upper reaches cascades down lots of little valleys and gills and there's a lot of little out-of-the-way waterfalls that people never really see. Of course, there's Aesgarth, which is world-renowned. But as well as Aesgarth, there's Redmire Falls, which is probably not as well known, but is just as spectacular. And there's little becks flowing into the upper Ewer, which have their own miniature waterfalls. The river virtually dictates my life. I get up at dawn, I go down to have a look at the river, I see it in all its moods, from being placid and gentle in summer with mayfly coming off, to a raging torrent in winter where you can actually hear the boulders going along the riverbed underneath. It's thundering, you can feel the river. I've stood and watched the river where it's just about to cascade over 20-foot flood banks. Uh, in the middle of the night with a gale blowing, and that's quite frightening. It's uncontrollable, and that's the nice thing about it. It's a wild river. The Wild River collects water from Wensleydale's most savage face of all, 
the wild boars and fens. High up and often shrouded by clouds, the top of the valley is another world, both beautiful and bleak. The windswept sanctuary of the Dale's most secret wildlife surprise. Jane and I have lived in Windsordale for just under 40 years. We came here to grow Christmas trees. The extremely high rainfall makes the foliage very lush and, and green. When Hugh and Jane Kemp settled up here, they had no idea that their home and surrounding forestry would end up with a touch of Beatrix Potter. The, the unexpected guess for us was the uh, discovery of the red squirrels. We were absolutely astonished. Uh, we had no idea at all that they were there. In fact, a number of people have said to us since, did we introduce them? Well, um, I don't know how you would acquire red squirrels. I don't think uh, we'd, we'd apply to uh, an advert in, in eBay. The Kemps think that the squirrels came from the Lake District using conifer plantations as staging posts before finally settling close to their home. I see the squirrels every single day. There isn't a day that goes by without me seeing them. It's very often when I'm washing up or making meals and I'm looking out of the kitchen window and watching them from there. When I first saw a squirrel here, it was such an excitement because it had been such a, a very austere place when we first came. And to have these wonderful little animals that are in such danger coming and living near us was the biggest thrill you could possibly imagine. The, the reason why I love Wensdale, uh, particularly Upper Wensdale, is its, its, its wildness. Nature still uh, has the upper hand here. Up here, the first snows can come at the end of October, and there's often more than two meters of rain each year. It's the wild realm of the curlew and its haunting call. Far too harsh to grow crops. But there is one farm animal which is tough enough to earn its keep up here. The sheep. You're most likely to see tough, black-and-white-faced swale dares, rugged hilltop survivors originally from the dale next door. They are the icons of the fell tops. But Wensleydale does have a very rare breed of its own, come on, come with a very different character. Come on, come on. Vet Jack Watkinson, my good friend, is determined to keep the unique long wool breed alive. On, hey. I keep the... Wensleydale breed, the local native sheep, developed in Wensleydale. The wool of the Wensleydale is very fine, high quality, luster wool. It is also closely pearled, that is a curl on it. These are qualities that the spinners and the weavers like. She's still in the working clothes, she wants a bit of washing down below and uh, tarting up a bit, but. When I look at it, she's better than I thought she was. Um, she's lovely, lovely fleece, right up into the skin, you see. Comes right down. There's no knots in it. They're very big sheep. They're some of, some of the biggest native sheep. They have a characteristic dark blue skin, big erect blue ears. 
I keep them for the tradition, because of the name, because I've lived my working life in Wensdale. I remember with great pleasure many of the Wensdale breeders. And actually, I started with three sheep, and uh, they've all been bred from those few sheep. Curiously, sheep, too, once played their part in the story of Wensleydale's cheese. As we've heard, it was French Cistercian monks who first brought the cheese-making tradition here a thousand years ago. Back then, sheep weren't just kept for meat and wool, they were also milked. And it was their milk that made the first of Wensleydale's cheese. Of course, it's all very different today. The animal may have changed, but the cheese-making tradition has survived. My granddaughter names them all, and she has a few of her own, which is showing, and she names them after her own friends at school. Her D this year, she's got a nice lamb too, it's Danielle. And the other one is Dazzler that she has. It's a Bobby Dazzler when it was, when it was born, I said, that's a Bobby Dazzler. I get them mixed up from a distance now and again, but I happen to know that's Bluebell. And uh, we've got Brittany, and Brittany is... <laughs> Brittany's lamb is called Dolly, Dolly Parton. Since I went into semi-retirement, I've enjoyed the show, the showing of them, the, the shepherding of them. And we think it's quite nice here, uh, even though we haven't got a Marks and Spencers. Howard, Howard, come on! The passion of people Howard. like Jack keeps the old ways and landscape alive. It's the same for Wensley Dale's wildlife, too. Without human help, the Dale's rarest residents in their craggy homes might easily disappear. Tony Creese not only created foxglove covert in the garrison, he monitors the wild peregrine falcon population too. Every year, he rings the new season's chicks. They are quite difficult to, to uh, get close to, depending on where they um, breed, and they do breed in some uh, fairly uh, inaccessible places. So um, it can be quite a challenge getting to them. Once a year, Tony enlists the help of an experienced army climber. It's not a task for the faint-hearted and needs careful preparation. You have to observe the nest for weeks on end uh, to make sure that they're exactly the right age when we go down, because, of course, we wouldn't want them to, to jump over the edge or something like that. Once the climber goes down, we very carefully bag them up and then uh, raise them to the top where the ringers are. A ring gives each chick its own permanent identity, a safeguard, which means each one can be tracked throughout its life. Although some people might um, have some concerns that we might drop them or that uh, we might um, cause the adults to desert. We know from years of experience that this doesn't happen. Coming down, Dren. We're in and out pretty quickly, actually, and, and it's all done very safely. OK. While the high crags and limestone quarries are home to peregrine families, the pure waters of the magnificent river Ure hide the most bizarre creature of all. Brian Morland and his wife Sue 
keep watch for them. Of all the fish in the River Yore, the one that fascinates me more than any other is the very rare sea lamprey. These prehistoric creatures are a metre long, predating dinosaurs by 200 million years. They're so ancient they don't even have jaws. Adult lampreys are real-life vampires who use their sucker-like mouth and rows of teeth to extract juices from the living bodies of other fish. A wild world where nature still holds sway and a timeless haven whose traditions are a source of great pride. It's the place where I was born, brought up and lived all my life. I like living here and I suppose I always will. I've lived in Wensterdale all my life and I think it's the most wonderful place in the world. Local people, I believe, are very proud of the area, um, of what it produces, and they're actually proud to show to visitors that they have actually looked after it, maintained it, and uh, they've got a very special cheese. <laughs>